today's scripture is taken from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34, verses 11 through 16. You may follow along by opening your Red Pew Bible to page 803 in the Old Testament. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep. I will seek them out as shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among the scattered sheep. So I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places they have which been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the watercourses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture in the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I will make them lie down, says the Lord. I will seek the lost, I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning, Chapelwood families. We are so glad that you're joining us on our live stream this morning. Wherever you are, from the comfort of your home or while you're on vacation, we're so glad that you're here. To register your attendance, to insert a prayer request, or to learn more information about what's going on here at Chapelwood, be sure to visit chapelwood.org slash home. Thank you so much again for joining us this morning, and we can't wait to see you back here at church. Well, good morning, Chapelwood family. You know, I saw a lot of you uh, kind of nodding your heads and tapping your feet. And do you know that there is a Chapelwood playlist on Spotify? So if you like the songs that you hear in the worship service, I'm not, I don't get sponsored by Spotify, by the way. Uh, I just know that, that James has created one mixed in a lot of the songs. And the one that they just sang is on there as well. James Kelly also has a page. Just saying. Thank you all. You know, this series we've been doing on darkness, there's, I'll have to be honest with you, I've told the guys this morning when we were in my office before the service pray, and I said, I don't know, man. I said, I'm kind of ready to be done with darkness. Like, but at the same time, I shared with them that I've had more conversations with people coming out of church or emails from the week where they say, you know, this has been an interesting series of sermons because we don't really talk a lot about being in the darkness or how, I mean, we've all been in darkness. We share that together. We've experienced darkness, but not as a processing as far as our faith and what it means for us. I think a lot of the times we expect and hope that all of our lives will be light, bright, sunny, rainbows, blue skies and clouds and mornings with temperatures like today, right? That's what we really want, but that's not the reality of life. And so I think we do ourselves a disservice if we don't actually talk about the darkness that we all will face, some of us may be facing right now, and talk about how God is present in the midst of that darkness. And so I, I've heard that it's led to a lot of great conversations, a lot of prayerful thoughts. I even had some really good questions this morning coming out of the first service about all of this. And some of them make me struggle too, to be perfectly honest with you. I want to share with you as we get started though, probably what is considered the most viewed photograph in history. <laughs> some of you obviously recognize this picture. Some of you might be too young. I think we all know what it is. This is actually a picture called Bliss. And it is the default screensaver for Windows XP. So just put some little icons and badges on there and you've got 
One of them, uh, probably because of every time you wake your computer up, this is the picture that's staring you in the face. In 1996, there was a photographer named Charles O'Rear who, was, uh, who lives in Napa County in St. Helena, uh, California. He was on his way to visit his girlfriend on a Sunday morning, and there was the storm in January that had come through the valley. If you've been there in the winter times, it can be kind of dark and dreary and rainy. And this particular storm, Charles said, as he was driving down the road, it almost felt like it was nighttime. But as he hit uh, in the southern part of Napa County where Sonoma and Napa meet, he was crossing the county line. He said, and all of a sudden, the, the clouds just parted, the storm lifted, and it was gone because it's kind of want to do that way in that area and he said and the sun came out and as I'm driving by this field he said it popped like no green I've ever seen. He was a photographer and an author and done wine books and all that so he stopped his car and he took out his photography equipment and he took this picture and the interesting thing is this picture is not photoshopped it's not edited in any way it has been since I'm sure but this is exactly what the picture looked like now if you go to this spot now or you look it up now there are uh, wine, <laughs> there's grapevines all on the side of that hill, but uh, it's called bliss. And, and I think that it, what's interesting to me is he talks about it. He goes, I'm driving down the road and it's completely dark outside. Then all of a sudden it lifts. And he says, I've driven this way many times. I've never seen the grass that green. And it was kind of a moment, a lesson that in the dark storms of life, Sometimes we think there's not going to be anything on the other side of that. But what we find not only in this life lesson but in Scripture is that it's in the dark times of life that God is often at work preparing something beautiful to emerge. You know, when it's dark, it feels hopeless. We feel uh, engulfed with despair. Things seem dire. And it seems like God is absent. But what we're learning here from the Scripture is that God is present in the days of darkness. And God is present in the days of darkness, willing to, desiring to, trying to allow us together to birth something new, something life-giving. Even when you can't see it, something new and beautiful is emerging. Former professor of mine, Barbara Brown Taylor, wrote a book called um, Learning to Walk in the Dark. And she said that in the darkness, God is at work. And if you can't believe that, then you're going to struggle to ever understand the purpose of darkness in your life. You're going to struggle to ever be able to find or experience transformation in your life when you go through seasons of darkness. She reminds us that new life starts in the dark, whether it's a seed in the ground that becomes a plant, whether it's a child born into this world from the womb of the mother, or whether it's Jesus' resurrection out of the darkness of the tomb. The Israelite people, the Hebrew people, walked in the dark. There were seasons of darkness for them. Jacob wrestles God in the dark. Jonah spends three days in the belly of a well in the darkness. Paul, when he was converted on the road to Damascus, was blind for three days. The whole earth was dark on Good Friday. For three hours, it says, the whole earth was dark as Jesus hung on the cross and finally gave his last breath as he died for us all. And then, of course, Jesus, Jesus in the tomb for those three days. And every single time in every one of those situations, what we know, and the Scripture tells us, is that even in the darkness, God is at work. Even in the darkness, God is present. And that's hard for us to make sense of. One of the conversations coming out this morning is, John, you know, Israel and Gaza and school shootings and all this, you know, and I just, I, I, I don't see it. I don't sense it. Where is God? Why does God? Well, that's the point of these sermons to help us to understand that God doesn't desire these things. God doesn't do these things to teach us a lesson or to bring us home or to, or to, to penalize us. But in the midst of a broken creation with broken people in a sin fallen world with sin fallen people, when darkness will come, it will happen. God is not absent from that. And that's the lesson that we take. In our scripture today in Ezekiel chapter 34, 11 through 16. Thank you, Mr. Persia, for a wonderful reading today. I couldn't have done it any better myself. And, you know, 
you listen to the scripture, and I want you to know that this is being spoken. Ezekiel, the Israelites, the Hebrews, have been conquered by the Babylonians. It's about 587 BC. The temple is destroyed, and all of the young, smart, academics, religious leader, political leaders, all of the up and coming, all of the wealthy people are taken into captivity and transported over to Babylon, which is now modern day Iraq. And what's left behind is a remnant where the lands have been destroyed, the temple has been destroyed, the way of life has been destroyed. So you have people back home, Jeremiah was the prophet for them, he remained back home. Ezekiel was taken in captivity with the Hebrews over to Babylon. And there they created cities of encampments outside this wonderful, massive city, considered one of the most beautiful cities in the day of Babylon. But they're in exile. They're not free to go home. They're enslaved. And they have experienced now things that have been put to death in a darkness. They lost their land. They lost their crops. They lost loved ones. They've lost their way of life. They've lost access to the temple. And in the Old Testament, they believed the temple was vitally important because that's the space, the geographical location where God dwells. So to be removed from that, for it to be desecrated, for it to be destroyed. I mean, it's hard for us to imagine that much despair and darkness that a people would face as if it's all over. It's at the end. It seems as if the darkness is all-consuming and it threatens to drown them in despair. Maybe you felt darkness like that. But what I love in this passage is that Ezekiel is hearing God speak to his people, and he recounts these words as a prophet is to do. And I want you to listen. I learned a long time ago that pay attention to the grammar in the Bible, who is the subject, and really pay attention to the verbs. The verbs are very important. And expresses action, but it expresses the action of, of whom? This mired in darkness and hopelessness, despair, listen to the, the subject and the action. God says, I will search, I will look, I will look, I will rescue, I will bring, I will gather, I will bring into, I will feed, I will tend. I will have them lie down. I will search for those who are lost. I will bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. I will destroy the sleek and strong. I will shepherd the flock with justice. The nature of God for those who are lost, for those who are in darkness, for those who are in distress, Ezekiel makes it very clear. This is who God is, and this is what God does. So no matter what darkness you find yourself in, the first thing you have to hear are these passages of Scripture that speaks to who God is and what God does when you are in dark days. This one little verse tucked away here in verse 12, I really like. It says, as the shepherds sort out their flocks when they are among scattered sheep, so I, the Lord, will sort out my sheep and I will rescue them from all of the places to which they have been scattered on a day of dark clouds and thick darkness. This has become my mantra this week. When people say, how are you doing? I said, well, mostly it's going all okay. Things are going okay. But you know, there have been some days of clouds and thick darkness. So I hope you can use that. Take it with you. It kind of describes a frame of reference. I would say over the past 10 years, it feels to me, and maybe it's just my own experience, that life has been more conflicted and divided. We've been at each other in ways that we, it doesn't feel like we, we've always been at each other, but it just seems different. It seems harder, it seems a little darker, it seems a little worse. And now I know I can describe those as days of clouds and thick darkness. As shepherds sort out their flocks, I will rescue them from the places they have been scattered on day of clouds and thick darkness. You know, last week we preached about Moses getting the Ten Commandments in the Sinai. And as he goes to the people and he shares with them the Ten Commandments, he returns back to the mountain and the people can see that there is a thick darkness. And God is dwelling in the thick darkness. And Moses just came out of it. <laughs> 
with the Ten Commandments. And they said, hey, Moses, do us a favor. You continue to be the media- mediator. You go talk to God for us because we don't want to go into the thick darkness. No one wants to go into the thick darkness. But Moses goes back into the thick darkness, the scripture says, where God was. And in this passage this week, the day of clouds and thick darkness becomes a a metaphor for the challenge and the distress that we live in exile, whatever exile that is for you in your life. For the captives, it was a time of utter and complete darkness. And I can imagine these Hebrews who had been conquered and carted away are asking questions like, where was God in all this? Have you ever asked that question before? Where was God in all of this? Why would God not prevent this? Why would God not prevent the destruction of the temple? Why would God not save us? Why would not God deliver us? Could God not have intervened on our behalf? I thought we were the chosen people. Ezekiel's prophecy is not here to highlight the utter darkness, not here to highlight the power of the dark and the fact that it comes, Ezekiel is highlighting through the words of God that this very darkness, in this very hopelessness, God enters. God is present. God will bring the scattered together. God will be the good shepherd that will not let his sheep be lost. You know, for us in our lives, we're going to experience times where we're we feel scattered. It can be a literal scattering of a physical part of your life. It can be scattering of your emotional health and mental health and well-being. It can be your family being scattered. It could be your friends being scattered. It could be your marriage being scattered or your workplace being scattered. It could be relationships between children or parents. We all go through difficult days, days of clouds and thick darkness. And one of the things that we're going to have to do if we're going to be able to not only see and sense God's presence in that, but to be transformed by God in that, is we're going to have to learn to do two very important things. You see, we trust our eyes too much. We have too much faith on our narrow and limited perception. We we believe that the little we see and observe is the full extent of what is happening in any given moment. But what's going to be required as we enter into the darkness is first, we are going to have to let go and die to certain aspects of who we are, our identity. And we are going to have to second, open ourselves up to something new and generative and creative and transformative. And that only can come by developing your spiritual perception. You know, uh, when we were on St. Simon's Island, we would go up sometimes and take trips to Savannah. They loved to do the horse buggy carriages. Old towns like Savannah and Charleston, I'm sure, you know, if you ever go to one of those older cities, New Orleans, they have the horse buggy tours. And when you're in downtown, uh, the horses, poor creatures, they just stand there and they have these blinders on their heads like this. And so all they see is like what's immediately in front of them. Horses can spook easy. There's a lot of traffic. And and so, you know, but I think what happens sometimes is we kind of put on blinders too. You know, we're afraid. We spook easy. There's like all the stuff going on in the world, a day of clouds and thick darkness around us. And we just want to pay attention to nothing else but what's right in front of me. That's all I want to see. I don't want to pay attention. I'm not going to turn on the news. I'm not going to pay attention to anything else. I got enough going on. I'm just going to focus on that. What happens, though, is we become very insulated or turned inward. Someone after the service a little while ago shared, you know, John, he goes, I like the, the blinders for the horse. He said, but you know, he goes, what's the opposite of that? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, like people who like don't, they have like their blinders are on the inside. So they don't pay attention to sort of what they need to be focused on, the center of their lives, their family, their workplace. But all they are is all they do is live in the news and live in the culture and live in the fear and live in the anxiety. It's like everything that pops, they have to have a reaction or get angry or afraid about. And I was like, I don't know what they call that. I said, I don't think it exists. 
outside of humanity, but I like, I like the idea of both ways blinders work for us. And for us, this, this new life that God has for us as we live sometimes in days of darkness and day of clouds and thick darkness, the new life of God, he is not hiding it from you. But sometimes it's very difficult to see. It, it becomes apparent by us developing a spiritual perception, which is an active process in our lives of removing the blinders, of, of learning what it is that causes us to cast our gaze in different things. What are our loyalties? What are our priorities? What are the things that we fall uh, trap into? What are the things that demand the loyalties of our hearts and our minds? We have to be able to notice that if we're going to participate in transformation. And I think a lot of times what happens is we so force ourselves to live only in the light. We don't ever want to live in the dark. We avoid the dark. If dark comes, we quickly move away from it. We deny it or we project onto other people. Other people become the enemies. Other people, it's their fault. We blame cast so that we don't ever have to do the work. It's kind of like I said at the beginning of the sermon. I'd like to move on to a happier, lighter topic but the reality is you have to sometimes sit in this space and wrestle with the tension that's there. If you're ever going to experience a new way of living, a new transformation. You know, you hear things are birthed from the darkness, like the picture of this little bean plant that's coming up out of the ground. It's birthed out of the darkness. But what happens is there are parts of the seed that have to die and be let go of. The exterior that protects the seed before it's in the ground has to fall away, die and decompose in order for new life to give way. You got to let go of the things that have been lost. You got to let go of the, the old identities, the old desires, the old demands. And the invitation to let go of the known world that has died and to stop pining for a return for the way things used to be. That's the only way that you can open yourself up. Let me give you an, an example of my own personal experience. You know, I've shared before, when I was 14, my father left. And part of my journey in a lot of ways was just hating my father uh, and being estranged from my father. And so that kind of was, a, that kind of defined me. I mean, for, gosh, probably... Oh, not quite 20 years, but almost that long. And so when people say you need to forgive your father or this, whatever, I, I would refuse to do it because that was who I was. I had to continue and hold on to my hatred of him, right? I couldn't let that go because he, he had done wrong. And you can't just let that stuff go, right? I mean, he, he didn't apologize. He got on with his new life and his new wife and his new kids. And I'm like, you can't just let that go. That has, there has to be a cost for that. And if uh, God's not going to pay the cost, then I'll make sure he gets paid a cost. Well, first off, that's not my job. I learned as I grew in my faith, I grew in my spiritual perception that there was going to never, was ever, never, ever going to be any transformation in new life for me in God until I was able to let that stuff die, let it go without any Precondition without me demanding how it has to finish or how it has to be tidied up or tied off into a nice bow. I was only able to notice new possibilities and be alert to new op opportunities and options and beginnings and transformation in my life when I finally had to admit the fact of the reality that was in it and die to that. Some of that has to happen to us in the darkness. I have seen more often than not people who get a diagnosis or maybe someone they love get a diagnosis. It could be a bad diagnosis. And part of what we do when we are there in the darkness is we so want it to be pre-diagnosis. We want everything to go back. What did I do to deserve this? Well, you didn't do anything to deserve that. That's not how God works. <laughs> but what happens is if we get stuck there wallowing in our own pity, I have seen people with terminal diagnoses who shrivel up, curl up, and that's the rest of their life. And I have seen people who, with God's presence in the midst of that, are able to 
accept the reality of what a hand has been dealt them. It's, it sounds almost like this is when you talk about darkness. You get into things like this, and it gets tough to, to, to talk about. Wait, can God work miracles? Yes, God can work miracles. I've seen it. Some of you have experienced it. But that's not based on my preference and my want and my desire. And more often than that, those diagnoses don't end up with a miracle of new life here. It comes fulfilled in a miracle of new life in the next life. But to let go, but to, let go to, to say my life is now redefined. I am now someone with cancer. And instead of curling up in a little fetal position in denial of, of God, your ability to work because I'm so broken, so angry, so mad, so into the why me, why me. The spiritual perception has not been crafted or created in such a way to, to, to explore the nuances that there are in that space. Sometimes it is a right phase of life to ask the questions why the psalmists do it, but we don't get stuck there. And I've seen more people's lives transformed when they're able to have a sense of acceptance about where they are and what they are. And that's when God begins to do a new thing. You see what I'm saying? And it doesn't mean you have to go around with your head down and say, well, something bad happens to me. I just got accepted or whatever. No, it's a spiritual reality. It's a spiritual way of living where you have cultivated a spirit for light and dark. The invitation to let go of the known things that have died, to stop pining for return to those days when it feels like you're sitting in a day of clouds and thick darkness in exile. What Ezekiel says is God is there. The great shepherd is there. The darkness is not dark to the shepherd. And the shepherd will come to you and the shepherd will find you. And the shepherd will never stop as you feel scattered in every direction to come to you and bind you together, to bind your wounds, tend to your wounds, to feed you, to give you rest, to bring you back to God's own self, to strengthen you and to heal your wounds. You can get there. But not if we refuse to die to the things that are behind us. There is no resurrection without death. If death is not involved, it's just resuscitation. Resurrection only comes when we die. Frederick Buechner said, this is the last quote I've got. Frederick Buechner says, the worst things are not the last things about the world. They are the next to the last thing. The last thing is the best. It's the power from on high that comes down into the world that wells up from the rock bottom, worst of the world, like a hidden spring. Can you believe it? The last best thing is the laughing deep in your hearts, the hearts of the saints, sometimes, yes, even in our own hearts. Yes, you are terribly loved and forgiven. Yes, you are healed. All is well. Darkness is not fun to talk about, and it's even less fun to walk through and experience. And when I talk about the spiritual perception changes of not only being able to die to the things of the past and to let things pass, then to open yourself up to something new and transformation, those two stages require spiritual perception. Then the question comes, how do I gain John's spiritual perception? How can I grow in my spiritual perception? And fundamentally, the easiest way is to engage in spiritual practices, prayer, Bible reading, coming to worship, being in community together. One of the books that I've been using recently is called The Methodist Book of Daily Prayer. They're in the library. Uh, you also get them on Amazon or, or uh, on your Kindle. I have one on my Kindle as well. And it goes through the year around themes. As a matter of fact, last week's theme, guess what, was darkness. And it's where the opening illustration of this sermon on the picture of bliss came from, was this devotional. And guess what? Today, this morning, the first day of the week, I'm supposed to wait till Monday. I'm supposed to take a Sabbath today. But I work on Sundays. You don't have to. Uh, so the first morning prayer was about gardening and patience. And that you can set up all of the stuff for the garden, but you don't make things grow. You don't determine whether it grows or it bears fruit. 
That's outside of your control. And I thought, you know, it's interesting. These, these devotions take three minutes. You have a prayer in the morning and a reading with a scripture. And then you have a prayer in the evening and reading scripture. And as Matt Miofsky, he was on the podcast this week. It'll come out Friday if you want to watch it and learn more. He said, look, if, it, if six minutes, you know, three minutes in the morning and three minutes at night is too much for you, just do the morning this year. Next year, do the evening. He goes, and now you got two years worth of devotional in a one-year book. So what a great value is that? <laughs> the spiritual disciplines are a huge part of us being uh, ready. I'll be honest with you, no one's ever ready to enter darkness. I don't want to enter into the darkness. But the reality is I will enter darkness again in my life. We all will. How will we grow in our spiritual perception so that when we are in the darkness, we know God is with us. God seeks us out to scatter, those who are scattered to bring them together and to learn to be able to let go and die to the things that need to be left behind. That's the only way then you can move into that second piece, which is to be transformed and recreated into something new, to find the reality of the great shepherd in the darkness seeking you out, all of you, so that you might lie down in pastures of green valleys back home again. That's the message for today. And it's a message for all of us who experience the rhythms of light and darkness. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Sermon series on darkness, not the most... Uh, uplifting type uh, topics that we deal with. But God, one of the things I'm learning as I'm wrestling through this is it's a, it's a place and a season and a time that we must give some attention to. Or it's the only way that we're gonna be prepared uh, to receive you when the darkness does come, to find you and to know that you're with us because you are there. So Lord, if we know someone going through darkness, I pray that we would walk alongside of them and help them through our own words and our own presence be uh, an incarnation of your presence, God, to remind them that they are not alone and that the great shepherd is seeking them out. We give you thanks for this day and every day. In the name of Christ, we pray.